Hello and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Covage. I'm the Executive Editor with My Security Media. And today we're joined by Vectra, their Chief Technology Officer there in Silicon Valley or nearby, Oliver Tavacoli. Uh, and we're also going to be looking at redefining defences, shifting to cloud and digital outsourcing. And we're going to uh, get Oliver's trends and observations uh, and from there in the US. Without further ado, Oliver, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good man. And uh, we mentioned uh, just your outside Silicon Valley there uh, and the CTO with Vectra. I think it's always good to, to speak to CTOs uh, and you often have different remits in terms of what you do. So maybe let's dive into your role as a CTO uh, and with Vectra. But uh, yeah. yeah, however you want to go in terms of your background or your, your current role as... as uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been here for long enough that, that uh, the background probably... Um, is ancient history at this point. So I've been here for, for nine years, pretty much okay. since we had no product and no customers to, to where we are today. Um, and my remit is kind of an interesting blend. You, you're correct, CTOs in uh, software vendors and security vendors can vary. They come in all shapes and sizes. Are they more internally focused? Are they more externally focused? I'm kind of a blend of those two. So, you know, I am deeply involved in kind of our day-to-day -day decisions on strategy and what we implement. Uh, I run a couple of teams directly. Um, on the one hand, uh, the security researchers who try and figure out what the bad guys are doing and what countermeasures we can deploy. And on the other hand, the user experience designers who try and then make that understandable to the end user. So those are my direct functions, um, but I deal with product and engineering all the time. And yet, I also spend a fair bit of time on the road, um, talk to customers. Uh, six weeks ago, I was in Germany and Switzerland. Next week, right. uh, in in Australia. So okay, and uh, sort of Vector, have you split out? You're the CTO. Do you have regional CTOs, or how have you struck we, your role? Yeah, we, we, we do. Like... We do have regional CT. We were starting down that pathway, so yeah. I guess you know I get the global moniker now. Now that we have more CTOs. Uh, so we're in the process of hiring several um, regional CTOs. We have one in EMEA at this stage and more um, in the wings. Well, that leads us to Vectra. Maybe describe uh, Vectra as a business, and it's obviously a global business now. Uh, and it's uh, most of our audience will have heard of you, obviously. We've, we have been covering your uh, sort of updates and company updates on our channels. But, yeah, just Vectra and your direction as well. As well. Yeah. I think, I think the, the origin of the company uh, really was almost 10 years ago now, where uh, at a point when there was still an attempt to uh, prevent all bad things, and the idea was still at that moment in time that if we just got prevention right, then the bad guys wouldn't be able to get in. I think we were at the beginning of that, that trend to, to really talk about resilience and to talk, talk about whatever defenses you have set in place bad guys will still get in. Um, and what is your resilience to those attacks? Can you find them um, as far left in the timeline as possible? Initially, that began by, that began by looking at the network because in those days, the, the network was wide open space in terms of people's on-prem networks. Um, that has inexorably shifted towards the cloud over the past uh, five years, probably. Uh, where we're looking at people's traffic in the, in the cloud networks. We're looking at people's logs uh, in, in cloud platforms like AWS and, and Azure and GCP. We're looking at uh, cloud identity systems like Azure AD. We're looking at applications like M365. So everywhere where you have attack surface that might be leveraged by an attacker, other than the endpoint, which is its own uh, market and its own interesting knife fight amongst a number of different players. Yeah, well, we're all hearing the digital transformation. I think one of the, the key words there is the digital outsourcing. I almost uh, accidentally said digital transformation because it's one of those two words come together. What's your observations in the digital outsourcing? And I suppose it's not just the technology defined, it's a, they're trying to outsource the risk. Uh, yeah, what's your observations on the digital outsourcing uh, in that context? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting problem. Ultimately, um, I think having people accept risk on your behalf who don't really understand your business, it feels like it's very hard to come up with an economic model that will make that workable. Um, and on, on the other hand, I think like supply chains and risk and outsourcing 
there's like this whole amalgam of risk that comes at you um, in, in various combinations. You can see attacks out there where MSSP, so managed security service providers who are managing things in your cloud or in your on-prem infrastructure are attacked and then used as a conduit to get into you. Mm -hmm. There's obviously the most famous supply chain attack of all, which is the SolarWinds hack uh, of a couple of years ago now. But when I talk to customers, there's also kind of in, increasingly this kind of concern around these hybrid systems. If you think about uh, human capital management systems such as Workday, or you think of automation frameworks such as ServiceNow, you have a UI in the cloud, um, but yet it's integrated fully into infrastructure that is running inside your corporate boundary. And if someone were to break into that portion of the cloud, they could effectively shut you down. Um, remotely. And so there's so much risk and so much transference of risk. And then not, that's not even getting into the shared responsibility model of cloud and, and, and these different things. It becomes increasingly difficult in this fractured world to get a very clear picture of what all the risk is and even what what parts of it to outsource, quite frankly, if you chose to do so. Yeah, I suppose it's got to keep a, a grapple on the complexity in this. As you mentioned, there's Sort of user interfaces touching infrastructure and you've got to be very very careful with that um i suppose the msps you're you're 100 channel in terms of how you distribute we're we're 100 channel we also have a service offering that still is sold through channel um and we also have um msps that offer our products in their services right so right. All, all kinds of options are available, but we primarily view ourselves as a product company that's channel, uh, that, that goes through the channel as a means of kind of getting to customers. Well, we're definitely hearing more on the MSPs. I think it's uh, that outsourcing to MSPs and the reliance on MSPs or MSSPs, but there's also, I think there's a little bit of a, a risk, uh, not risk, I beg your pardon, a, a little bit of a skill outsourcing. It's hard to find good people. You've got to go to MSPs because they're sort of the, that source of, you know, it's something you can rely on, and sometimes it's a challenge to find a good one. Um, what are you going to be doing here in Australia? I suppose that might bring us into your observations, sure. what you will bring to Australia as well in terms of what you're currently seeing. Yeah, I, I am. Uh, I'm going to be. Uh, so the anchor for this trip originally was a cybersecurity conference, the AISA cybersecurity conference in Canberra, um, that was supposed to occur, I think, in March. Yeah. Um, given the COVID spike at the time, it was delayed. So my trip was delayed. And then what we've done is we've decided to have me in region for a couple of weeks and sprinkle a bunch of customer uh, meetings <laughs> around that. Um, so on June 1st, I will be in Canberra. And outside of that, I'll be in Sydney and Melbourne and, and Brisbane as well. Okay. Do you find, Vector, do you find certain market verticals that you're stronger in? Uh, and do you find it changes between the regions? We, it's been interesting. Um, the, 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 problem that, the problem space that we picked, which was basically like, hey, do you have something worth stealing, um, is a pretty broad one. Yeah. Um, now, certain verticals are driven more by compliance mandates. Um, and so in the early days, yes, I mean, medical, financial, um, which, which are highly regulated industries, certainly in a lot of the world, um, led led the, the, the portfolio that we had. But we also, interestingly, had, even in the early days, universities sign up for us, for, for, yeah. for our, our products and services. What's happened, I think, over the past three or four years is compliance is, is less and less really driving the issue. What's driving it now is simply at a board level, are we ready for a ransomware attack, right? And no degree of compliance check marks are necessarily going to uh, protect you against that. And so I think we have gone beyond simple compliance to what is our resilience, what do, what does our defense look like, basically. Well, that was kind of the title of this one that I grabbed is redefining defenses. Do you yeah. think the the trend, the sort of the, the the migration to the cloud? Do you think that the journey will continue in terms of that, or is once you're into the cloud, uh, we're talking about multi-cloud and, and hybrid? It, where do, where do you think we end up uh, in terms of this yeah. the transformation? Uh, the journey is, is used all the time, but do you see an endpoint that we can get comfortable and settled uh, into these cloud environments? I think, I think it's difficult. Um, 
I think where we've gotten to, how we've gotten here has been oftentimes that, you know, uh, companies have gone multi-cloud uh, or hybrid cloud, not because there was some grand strategy to go there, but because, you know, three different business units ran off in three different directions. And then yeah. eventually the security team was brought in and said, here, solve this. And the problem with each of, with, with, with all of these systems is that they are each and every one of them quite complex. And they're each and every one of them a snowflake in the sense that they, they, they bear no resemblance to each other. If you're an expert at security in AWS, that helps you very little in understanding security in Azure or in GCP. Um, and you know, if you're, if you're really good at understanding Active Directory on-prem, it doesn't actually really help you understanding Azure <laughs> Active yeah. Directory in the cloud. So, you know, what's happened is we have, we have chosen kind of business agility and, and speed. And, and quite frankly, the, the pandemic and COVID for a while put this on steroids because the first order of business was just, you know, all my employees have gone home, make it work somehow. Yeah. Um, and we, know, we, we, we knew of a fair number of our customers who went from having a, okay, we're gonna have this one year pilot to try out Microsoft 365 and decide to maybe give up our exchange server to you know suddenly in March of 2020, just deciding next week we will cut everyone over. Um, yeah. And so you went from this you know, highly deliberative process that probably was taking longer than it should to one that, that was more like, let's get over there and then we'll figure out how to fix it afterwards. And so I think there is there is a degree of reckoning coming in terms of just trying to figure out the complexity of what you've done. If your mission critical data is in Salesforce and in ServiceNow and in Workday and in Microsoft 365, and oh by the way, you still have your on-prem network and you're in two clouds. Yeah. Uh, okay. The reason you like to outsource oftentimes is that there's a skill shortage, but quite frankly you've made it almost impossible for a staff of say five or 10 to get their heads wrapped around just the complexity of everything you've taken on. So I think over time, what will happen is, um, you know, people will try and simplify that. I think getting fewer stacks, being on fewer clouds. Um, yes, there is a business imperative to be on maybe more clouds for, for to have some leverage in negotiating cost and to have some redundancy but the degree of complexity and the, the degree of dispersion is probably not affordable in the long run. I think you've encapsulated that really well. There's a lot of reviewing on going on, that, you know, in terms of our observations as well, We're trying to redu uh, reduce the number of vendors that they're dealing with. Uh, but I think you're right. They've grappled for the last sort of two years or so, uh, just in the in the scramble of a pandemic uh, and making sure that their businesses are running. And now it's a a, a reflection now uh, and also there's a little bit of fatigue the fatigue has passed and now there's like okay deep breath uh, and let's review what we're doing I suppose that comes back to uh, so that internal threat and you know the, the the threat landscape as well there's internal threats employees you know not doing the right thing uh, by accident and otherwise and now we have sort of a, a war in in Ukraine and in Europe how do you view your role in that threat landscape? Because you have a broad sort of platform and we might even dive a little bit deeper into that platform if you don't yeah. mind. But yeah, yeah. How does, and in fact, maybe that's the, that's the link there in terms of that broad threat landscape that you, uh, uh, that we all see and then yeah. your platform itself. I think it's, uh, I think there, there are distinct problems. I mean, I, I think in general, the insider threat problem, um, whether, you know, Either a, 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 a well-meaning employee who does something, something and exposes you, which which I wouldn't even call inside threat, versus kind of you know somebody inside the company who is acting within the confines of the, their accepted role, but is doing something dodgy. Those are those are difficult problems, and those are by nature, if you need to solve them, they're noisy problems. And and I think customer struggle, most of our customers struggle getting their arms wrapped around how much noise they're willing to accept to mitigate that risk because there's expensive cost. The outside attack is, is kind of obviously front and center. If you look at supply chain, if you look at uh, you know, conversations around ransomware, those are all kind of outside attacks. Um, traditional attacks that kind of worm their way into your environment and then do bad things. 
The new one that we've seen, which is kind of weird, is you know in the context of of the the war in Ukraine, is that you know what you're seeing is the mobilization of a whole bunch of um, freelancers on both sides, right? Um, emotions run high, and so if you're a freelancer, you know inside of a company, you might decide, hey, you know I want to DOS some Russian website. Um, and I'm going to do it from inside the company that I work yeah. at, right? So, so you now have to start worrying as a security person, is my network being used as a launching point for attacks? And that could obviously also result in risks like reprisal attacks um, because you've now kind of putting a bullseye on, on, on your own company. So that's kind of an interesting problem. What we did at the, you know, once the war broke out, we offered everyone in the region, Poland and other countries in that region, organizations free services if they felt they were going to get targeted and, and, and try to help mitigate that. And that cut across the spectrum of their networks, their, their, you know, um, uh, their cloud usage in as much as they have cloud usage, you know, Microsoft 365, um, uh, you know, cloud identity, all of those systems. And, and we have had, had uptake from a number of organizations in, in the region on that front. Well, it, it kind of does bring us to your, you mentioned you're coming to Australia to present. Are you going to focus on anything in particular, the, the ransomware threat? Uh, yeah. 2021, but we're still, you know, the, the threat is still there, but it's a bit more uh, sort of targeted now. Yeah. Like for, for me, again, I, I, I'm a CTO, so I spend most of my time thinking what's going to happen next year and a year beyond. Um, you know, I have my colleagues in, in uh, product management and engineering to build the stuff that we're, that we're going to be shipping for most of this year. So the thought experiment that, that, that myself and a few of my colleagues have started to play is, okay, um, ransomware is a lucrative business model. We check, we get that. Um, customers' valuable data is moving to the cloud. Check, we get that. Ransomware is going to move to the cloud. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so that's going to be kind of inexorably th true, right? So uh, from, from our perspective, then, um, what does that, the question is, what does that actually look like? Like if ransomware were to move to the cloud, um, what does that look like as a thought experiment? And what measures should you take now? And why do we believe it's going to move there? And so my, my talk in Canberra is going to be on that topic. It's going to be kind of a thought experiment with a few <laughs> anchors in terms of why do I believe this is going to happen and, and what early harbingers exist out there, but it will be squarely looking at how protecting yourself against randomware, ransomware and cloud systems is substantially different than the defensive measures that you're taking on-prem. How do you think the SLAs are set for that kind of situation? Uh, yeah, what, what's your early observations? As you say, it's a thought experiment, but the service level agreements for cloud services, do you think they is have you Yeah, no, I mean I think I think these really fall most of these attacks clearly fall in the in the shared responsibility model fall on your side of the ledger, right? Right. Okay. Um, but the thing to the thing to realize is on prem, like if somebody wants to encrypt all your data, they have to go through this laborious exercise of connecting to your server, pulling all of the data across the network encrypting it, writing it all the way back to the server. And so there's a speed problem of, you know, why ransomware operators generally want to get their hooks into as many places as possible and then ready, set, go, encrypt as much as possible so they, yeah. that they have a high degree of likelihood of having, having encrypted things that, that, are, that you need. In the cloud, um, first of all, you have scalable compute. Secondarily, Clouds are really nice in that, you know, for security reasons, they allow you to do server side encryption of say, you know, in AWS S3 buckets. So you can literally just say, create a new S3 bucket, copy data from S3 bucket number one to S3 bucket two, while having set a key, an encryption key on S3, S3 bucket number two, it'll all get encrypted without you having to do any heavy lifting. And then all you need to do is go delete you know, S3 bucket number one. And now the data is still in your cloud, but it is, yeah. you get at it. And so, <laughs> so, the hook, 
So yeah, once you're in there, I suppose once yeah, with admin rights in your cloud environment, you you're gone, right? Yeah, yeah, but 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 the fact that you can do this at, you know, at incredible speed with incredible yeah. resources available to you changes the equation in terms of how you think about protecting yourself and where where you have to protect yourself. So those are kind of parts of the thought experiment. Nice, and and maybe that links back to where, where does Vectra sit in that in, in terms of your cloud platform as well. Are you able to? Yeah, I mean, for that? us, for for us, we look at a, a cloud like AWS as or Azure as really having two different attack surfaces. Uh, there's the traditional attack surface. You can still attack a cloud through the network, attacking a workload running in the cloud, escape that workload, and then go steal stuff. That's one entry point. But there's also this other entry point, which is really the management plane or the control plane of your cloud portion, which is great. Somebody in your organization made a mistake and checked um, you know, one of your REST API keys into a, into a Git archive. Uh, and now the attacker has this REST API key. Well, they can, they can effectively attack you through the management port into your cloud. Um, without ever have, hitting the wire that's any, in any way visible by a firewall or anything, any construct like that. So we, we have products in both of those spaces. We try and protect you in terms of being attacked from the network. We try and protect you in terms of being attacked at the control plane level. And our job is, again, similar to what we've, what we've always done. It's not to necessarily look at the, the inbound vector. The inbound initial vector can be incredibly complex and incredibly varied. But once it lands and establishes some foothold in the environment, can we find it and help you stop it before it does actual damage? Well, I think it's uh, one to watch out for. I'm currently in Singapore. You're there in the US. You're coming down to Australia. We'll both be back uh, in country next week. And I think it's uh, it's definitely one that we need to be looking out for. You, you actually, um, I think you're on to something here in terms of both the danger and the threat. But the ransomware hasn't gone away. Uh, I think there's other things going on. We mentioned uh, what's ha happening in Europe as well, which mm -hmm. takes the headlines away. Uh, but there's still a lot of companies grappling with this. So it uh, sounds like it's well worth catching up with you when you're in Australia and presenting. Uh, maybe just go through those cities again and uh, also how long you're going to be spending in the region. Sure. Uh, I, I think I arrive on the, the on Wednesday, the 25th of May, and we'll spend the rest of that week in Sydney. Uh, the following week, which will be, I guess, uh, May 29th or so, I think I'm in uh, two days in Melbourne. The next two days, I'm in Canberra. And the last day, uh, which is Friday, June 3rd, I will be in Brisbane. Great. Uh, and flying back to the U.S. on June 4th. Well, look, reach out to Oliver. He's the CTO for Vectra. Uh, take that opportunity. And hopefully, you'll be meeting with clients as well as presenting uh, at uh, various forums as well so do enjoy your trip down to australia yeah i'm looking forward to it plus i get to find out how tall everyone is that we hire <laughs> yeah actually time. yeah and just off topic i've just found out uh, uh doing that here in singapore meeting some people i've known for years but have not yet met so uh, it was quite a good experience so do enjoy that uh, oliver thank you very much thank that's you. oliver tavacoli the cto with vectra thanks for coming on my tv thank you a lot good man